Good evening. So the future of helmet tech is what I'm going to be speaking about uh, tonight. When, when you think of the helmet, uh, since its inception, it's been really something of uh, being a mystery, of, uh, of being involved uh, really in an experience. From back in, uh, in Roman days with gladiators to present day gladiators on the football field, uh, the military as well, or even in sci-fi like Darth Vader, you see the helmet, you put it on your head, and you become transformed into, into something else. And what we've done with Helmet Tech is that with an addressable market of about 100 million people, helmets are used pretty much every day, from people who ride the bike, construction, to uh, other sports such as uh, football, baseball, uh, and even the uh, military. And what happens is that, again, you put it on and you are just put into a different experience because you have to actually have something on top of your head. So the helmet, as we know, was originally designed for impact, safety. Protect you against from falling. Um, if you're for a combat, for protect you against getting attacked. Uh, in sports, from, uh, from impact against uh, falls and getting collided with, uh, with someone else. Or construction, something uh, on top of your head. And with that, you know, with, with the, uh, with, with making helmets, it was protecting really against concussion and other sorts of head injuries like uh, dr traumatic uh, brain injury. But with what GoPro had done is that they showed that with electronic integrations, you could actually make the helmet a bit more. And with it, by putting the, the uh, camera on top of your head, it could actually go and start to record what you were doing in your particular activity, whether that's gonna be in the workplace or whether that's for sports or again, for military combat. And they show that you can record for video, for audio, be connected in some format, or have some sort of just rudimentary uh, communication. But what happened if you could actually make the helmet into the ultimate wearable device? And that's where we see that it could become. So where you look at Star Wars, for example, big sci-fi, you have something on top of your head and you can have a heads-up display, you can have communication where you can not only record, but communicate with your friends, with someone else. If you're working in construction, you can communicate with the foreman to make uh, your job more efficient. If you're on the field, say for example, for, for you guys who are football, uh, football play, uh, fans, you could actually see the, the same uh, line of sight as, for, as Tom Brady is going to throw to our, our Gronkowski. Or if you are with your, with your loved ones, you know, if you, say if you and your boyfriend or your sister or, or your girlfriend, you're taking a ride in France and you guys are on your, on your uh, bicycle and you're communicating helmet to helmet, okay? And you're talking to each other and instead of having to take out your phone to record or having a big GoPro on top of your head, which can sometimes be uh, a bit clumsy, it's all in one seamless device. So say you're on a road down in France and uh, you're with, uh, say, your mom, and you're going down, instead of having to take your phone out of your pocket, now you can actually have it voice activated with your helmet because it's safety. You know, it's very clumsy to go and, and take out uh, your phone and stop because all of a sudden that experience that you see may have disappeared. So I don't know, for some of you guys, you know, with a smartphone, when they actually had the phone and you would have to go and attach uh, an accessory on top of your phone, to then take a camera. And that became an additional expense. You forgot about it. But then when the smartphone came, all of a sudden it became into, integrated into one seamless device. So even in sports now, um, where concussion is a major problem, and, and I was a wrestler and I had sustained a number of concussions, having sensors embedded inside, uh, uh, biosensors inside your helmet is really important. So where it's elevated, instead of just using impact sensors that use gyroscopes or accelerometers, now imagine you can have miniaturized EEG sensors that can mon uh, measure and monitor your brain waves to see if you got, in fact, a concussion. And for those of you who, have, you know, who read the news, uh, you know, recently in the military, what happened, unfortunately, in Iraq with the soldiers now, was actually on the front page of uh, the Wall Street Journal over the weekend, where the soldiers, the military now is trying to find a way to detect concussion in real time. 
And now you have that ability to have a miniaturized EEG sensor to do that similarly for your, uh, for your, your watch, to go do that with an EKG to measure your heart rate in real time. So that gives you, for example, on-site diagnostic uh, information that's done in real time objectively without having to go and measure your eyes and, and do a walk on the line to see. And again, I've had to do that you know, as a wrestler, but I've also coached to where I wasn't clinically uh, educated enough to know if a concussion actually was sustained. But now with the technology of a miniaturized EEG sensors, you can actually do that in real time very, very easily. Now we're looking at embedded audiovisual communication. So imagine now with the heads up display, that's really, really cool stuff that's happening now. So again, if you're playing a, a sport such as football or flag football, you could actually have that information that plays inside. So instead of just saying, for example, on the professional side, if you're, if you're with your friends, you could have the plays on side in the, uh, in the uh, display, connected to your phone with your coach on the sideline. And then also how that connects to your, your, your social media. So when you have these plays inside, now you want to have your, the same experience connected to your Instagram, your Snapchat, Twitter, your TikTok. All this information now can be pretty much streamlined in a very small space. Now, with this, what makes the helmet so attractive other than a smartwatch or any other wearable device is the amount of real estate that a helmet has to offer. So as you can see, it's pretty modular to where you can have an Internet of Things approach to where all of this stuff fits inside of a helmet to do all these really cool things that you can have as modular pieces where you can have a, a plug and play system, which really can't be done either with a smartphone or any other wearable uh, device such as uh, a smartwatch, just because you don't have enough real estate there. But now you can have your helmet as a true uh, communication device. So what you see for on Star Trek or see on Star Wars or any other sci-fi film, I don't know, do you guys remember the, uh, the movie uh, Predator? And you saw that when he, had, when he had the mask on, you can see all the cool things that, that are happening, and then he's communicating. I mean, you know, a, lo a lot of the tech that we see now actually started out from sci-fi movies. And the technology now exists at a very, very inexpensive way but here, the helmet actually um, can, can do that. And actually, we're doing that uh, now with, uh, with, with Batois by having all these types of really cool uh, tech uh, integrations. So why is this important? Because today's consumer wants to be connected. Whether you're a Gen Z, a millennial, Gen X, what have you, you really want to be connected. And as you can see, whether it's, again, the biggest uh, uh, social media platforms are all looking here with, with audiovisual. Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, they're continuing to grow. And the average uh, person now has about seven, uh, a little over seven connected devices. So with these devices, you can see that there's a true need. Because unlike a smart, uh, smart uh, watch, for example, it's not really necessary. But in an activity that requires a helmet, a helmet you need to be safe. But why not elevate that experience to something that's really, really cool? So I was, was talking to a friend of mine uh, who skydives a lot. And he said that, you know, that the number one injury uh, that happens in skydiving is a result of the GoPro that's attached on. Because when you, when you jump out, it actually gets tangled up inside the, the, uh, the netting. And they really wish that they could have actually something embedded and that they could actually communicate uh, via Bluetooth to another person who's actually skydiving. So that they're, they're not just trying to scream, but they can actually talk, even though it may not be audible because they're, you know, screaming as they're going, <laughs> as they're going down. But, um, but even going back to uh, the, uh, the bike, do you guys remember when you had like the walkie-talkie and then you could talk to someone? Well, again, all that stuff exists, but now it exists in a very cool way with, uh, with, the, uh, with the helmet. So we see the helmet as really the next wearable device that actually is a true device in terms of engagement, connectivity, and community. And something that's actually really needed because instead of having, like I said, another uh, smart, uh, smart device, 
like a, like a, like a, 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 a smartwatch, where you can actually just have that into your, your drawer, a, div, a helmet you actually need for the activity in which safety is required. But elevating that experience into something new and something really cool and creative that actually can get hooked up to your phone is something that's really, really exciting. And we see that the uh, technologies today can really do well in having an ultimate device such as uh, your helmet. Thank you. Awesome, Mario. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. Quick, quick question for me. Um, so, in terms of the use case for this helmet, obviously you named a couple of different use cases: the military, uh, professional sports, uh, recreational sports. Are there, there obviously you know different environments uh, determine different features? Or you know, if you're in the military, you're probably not sharing to social media the clips from your helmet, and you're more focused on safety and. Um, that sort of thing. So the point of the question is, are there different variations of the helmet based on the use, or is it kind of a one-size-fits-all approach? Well, it's pretty modular because it's a plug-and-play. So because now the, uh, the electronics um, don't have to be necessarily wired, you can actually pick the pieces that you want and plug them inside. So like, for example, we're going uh, paintball shooting on, on, uh, on Sunday. And I was telling some of, the, some of the guys that were going with, I was saying, you know, it could be cool. It could be like, be, we wish that your helmet could be like in the Call of Duty to where you can communicate with the, with the other player. And then all of a sudden, you're in this whole experiential thing that, that's happening that you would normally find in a game like Call of Duty or, 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 or in a movie. And then even some of the guys that we're talking to now for flag football to where they want to be able to talk to each other just on the, uh, on the headset and to then... Um, talk to each other, uh, to talk to each other while, while they're on the field, playing just a regular, you know, flag football. And we had an actual conversation with the MTA who had come to the office, and they were saying, you know what, what would be really interesting for us is having the camera inside with the communication system of the audio, because when they were building the tunnel here uh, in Manhattan, it's about $50,000 in overtime that they have to do when there's a problem of getting it wrong. Because what they do with the old-fashioned way, someone takes a photo, then they send it to the foreman upstairs and then and, and the engineer. And then all of a sudden, there's a mistake. And that's a $50,000 mistake of overtime because they were not able to have the communication seamlessly done. Yeah. Wow. And one other, one other quick question, just because I know your, your background is so, is so fascinating. So uh, how did your background in uh, wrestling and you said UFC, how did that you know, play into you starting this company? So I wrestled for a long time, uh, both in college, um, in New York Athletic Club, for some of you guys who are familiar with that in New York, and, uh, and then I coached as well. So I coached a number of fighters who fought in the UFC and, and, uh, and such, and head injuries was a big problem. So this became as a, as a project, of, as a graduate research project starting at NYU, and uh, we won a tech competition uh, from there, and then transferring over to Columbia, it just continued to evolve. And it was really interesting is that we made the, the, our first design for wrestling headgear, but not realizing that it was so modular that if you looked at it, it was for applicable to, to different sports. So just from looking at, at head injuries and then from there saying, okay, let's make something much better, much more unique, and it just continued to evolve into a communication device. Awesome. I will take a couple of questions from the audience. Wow. All right. Yeah, thank you. I'm not going to make any remarks about Astros and his hand signals for the World Series, but I wonder if you've ever planned or considered this for chemotherapy, meaning much like when we're talking about brain injuries in real time, because does the chemotherapy actually have an impact at the time uh, that it's happening? Because as you go through chemotherapy, you typically have a helmet on that looks much more like a fencing helmet. So, you, so is your question, have we thought about chemotherapy? We, did, we have not. Uh, we've looked at this primarily as a, as a, as a sports uh, uh, headgear slash helmet. Um, but again, it could evolve depending on the needs of, of the end user. So um, where is the HUD system on this helmet? And how have you addressed that in terms of battery and life and and durability if it's going to be for football. 
So it comes in, in, in as a plug and play system. Um, and th that's how we're actually developing it. So we're developing it as, as, a, as a plug and play system to as an attachment or as an accessory. Because there are gonna be certain instances to where a HUD can be used or shouldn't be used even with a, uh, a speaker or a microphone. So by p putting it in as a plug and play, it, uh, you're just allowed to just p put in the pieces that you need. So on the battery life, that's still being worked out. Hey, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, if you were to, put, to pick one usage, like we spoke about uh, the militaries, uh, skydiving, and many more types of usage, if you got to pick only one, what, uh, what would it be and why? Because in my mind, uh, all those usage are really different in the ways like a military would like to protect itself, uh, skydivers would like to enjoy. So what according to you is like the best usage of that helmet? So right now, um, there, so for the non-electronics version actually, because we have two versions, uh, it's for the sports to wear, right now it's, it's wrestling. But now we're going into, uh, we started already going into non-tackle football, and skateboarding. And the reason why it's non-tackle football is because um, there's, a, well, a couple of reasons. There's a drop now in tackle football and there is a rise in non-tackle football. And for the tackle football community, there are mandatory regulations to have non-tackle practices. So we can see that going right away to where a coach, from a coaching perspective, to help elevate the game of play, as well as to athletes want to be able to see each other catch and communicate uh, while they're on the field and take that those photos and then share them just because of, off for Instagram. And the other part of that is also in, in the same set is looking at skateboarding. So skateboarders, they hate actually wearing uh, uh, helmets just because getting hurt is a badge of honor. But speaking to them and doing part of our customer discovery, they realize that having some sort of connectivity, uh, particularly um, on, the, on the visual and the audio for them, is really interesting because it'll just take them to a place that they've never had before um, on the uh, on skateboarding. Yeah, another one right here. Hi, I was wondering, uh, is do you have an idea of how much trauma or damage to the helmet it can withstand without damaging the hi hardware inside? So th w that's what we're working on uh, now. Um, is uh, but th the sensors are really small enough to where if you encase it, it actually does get protected very well um, against breakage as well as against impact from the person who's actually wearing wearing the helmet. Uh, and then of course you have, um, you have to follow different protocols in order to test that uh, to make sure that, um, again, the user is not gonna be injured uh, by impact. So it all comes through the design. So you have to get a very good industrial designer to make sure that doesn't happen. All right, we'll do one more quick question. Sneak through here. Normally have a little mid avenue. Uh, this is what are your largest distribution challenges and how do you plan on overcoming them? Uh, let's see, our largest distribution challenges. Um, for our initial market, it has been, well, it's a startup. So that, that, that's a really tough question because every challenge is, is, is difficult. Um, but I would probably say uh, just early adoption because the thing is that you, for us, we didn't want to make a product and have so many uh, units that if there was a problem, um, that we would have sort of, say, a, a Boeing situation, unfortunately. Or when Samsung came out a, a few years ago with their smart device, they made so many, they had a massive recall because they didn't um, test it out in a small batch. So as a startup, as you know, every penny counts. So for us, it was really making sure that we, had a, that we did a small enough, um, I, I wouldn't say MVP, but just a small enough distribution that if there was a problem, we can address it right away until we decide to pick up on distribution. So, so I think that was it for us, is making sure, is making that decision, how many uh, products did we want to, or units rather, did we want to sell before we decided to make the larger jump so that we could address uh, any problems that happened in case they did happen. Hi. Um oh. Yeah, so I'm um, just curious that because um, I know like Google Glass, it has similar features. It can like uh, with your streaming and it can do like a, a Bluetooth, it can talk and it can even search the internet. Um, it's kind of a similar to your product and I think it failed unfortunately because of the, um, it didn't really solve the customer pain point. So I'm just curious like why do, 
like what is it different with your product? So sports is a different animal. Uh, what Google Glass did is that they were looking for the everyday consumer that really didn't have any attachment to sports. Uh, sports, if you look at wearable devices, most of it is actually coming from sports. So if it gets validated in sports, it, um, then it goes to the larger consumer base. If you look at what happens in the Olympics, all the big brands, whether it's Adidas, Nike, Puma, uh, Under Armour to a certain extent, they use the Olympics as the platform to show the most advanced technology that they have. And then when it comes to regular consumers, they dumb it down a bit just because it's not needed with all those features. But the proof of concept is done at the Olympic level, and then they stream it down to where it's cost effective while addressing some of the pain points that the everyday consumer has, but not that the uh, high profile uh, athlete needs. Awesome. Mario, thank you so much for joining us, kicking the night off. Thanks.